Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, um, especially to Jan, and I got uh, invited to this meeting because, as you've heard, I did lecture one more time, uh, one, once before, at an anesthesiology meeting where I met Jan, and after my lecture, he must have liked my lecture, he said, you know, would you like to come and uh, lecture in the Navat meeting, and uh, so it's my pleasure to be here and to talk to you, not about anesthesiology, but maybe still uh, something of interest to you, because uh, in anesthesiology, of course, you are interested uh, in the brain. So I don't uh, uh, work clinically, and uh, I'm actually a physicist by training. And what I do really is uh, development of tools, tools uh, researchers and uh, clinicians uh, can make use of uh, in studying predominantly the human brain, but also other organ systems. Now, uh, I want to emphasize that this is an important endeavor, uh, tool development, because I'd like to use the words of um, Freeman Dyson, you know, who's a theoretical physicist uh, from Princeton and who gave a series of lectures, which were later on published, where he says the new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. So indeed, I subscribe to this, and um, especially for the brain, after all, if you think about uh, what has revolutionized our understanding of uh, brain function, the introduction of neuronal doctrine, that was by Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who had uh, these uh, fantastic uh, drawings and uh, described uh, neurons in, um, in the brain and led to the, uh, uh, the neuronal doctrine, as uh, I have mentioned. But, I mean, he was a, you know, he was a fantastic artist, of course. Um, he apparently thought about becoming an artist, uh, but then switched to science. And uh, he was a brilliant observer. But he had one more thing uh, that was going for him, and that was the discovery of the microscope. So in a sense, what I work on uh, is uh, kind of a modern day uh, microscope. Uh, but instead of using uh, light, uh, we use uh, radio frequency waves and magnetic fields. And we use this for a variety of reasons. and. Uh, but for me, uh, one of the most interesting things is the fact that we try to understand how the human brain works. And again, uh, looking at another Nobel Prize winner from my alma mater, uh, Columbia University, Eric Kandel, who said uh, in this book, uh, which is actually about art and science, he said the central challenge of science in the 21st century is uh, to understand the human mind in biological terms. I don't need to quote Eric uh, for this. We all, I think, subscribe to this. Uh, at, at the present time, but I chose his uh, uh, formulation of this particular concept and uh, so uh, decided to give him, of course, credit for it. Besides the fact that we are, you know, curious about this uh, incredible uh, machine uh, that does all sorts of very incredible things and how it works, uh, we do have another problem that we face in society, and this is data from the United States, but exactly the same data is uh, available for European Union, and it looks exactly like this. Namely, brain disorders, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, are the biggest source of uh, disease burden in uh, advanced societies. And this is, of course, uh, creating a lot of uh, interest and focus on trying to tackle these problems. And uh, in the words of um, NIH's uh, um, uh, National Institute of Mental Health, so if you look at, uh, with respect to psychiatric diseases and neurodegenerative diseases, Tom Inzel, uh, who now actually is uh, retired from NIH, he, he said, uh, bottom line is prevalence has not decreased for any illness and mortality has not decreased for any illness. So there's quite a bit of uh, urgency about this uh, uh, problem. And uh, in, in the United States alone, uh, National Institute of Health invest something like seven billion dollars annually for uh, brain research. But in addition to that, uh, because of the importance of this problem, today we see a lot of um, uh, additional investment in brain research. For example, uh, the one I will talk to quite a bit is uh, the Human Con Connectome Project from NIH. And uh, uh, started by uh, President Obama, the Brain Initiative, uh, that actually focuses on uh, tool development and in the European Union, uh, you have the human uh, 
Connect Dome project. So when we deal uh, with all these projects and uh, we're talking about uh, human brain, the technology that dominates the study of uh, human brain is magnetic resonance imaging. And you all know that in magnetic resonance imaging, you can obtain uh, beautiful anatomical images uh, of the brain and all other parts of the human body. And uh, you can uh, differentiate, uh, for example, in the brain, a lot of uh, structures in the millimeter scale, uh, like uh, the gray-white matter differences and subcortical gray matter, etc. But what has really uh, revolutionized uh, studies of the brain uh, is not just this anatomy, which is really used for clinical uh, studies uh, predominantly, is the introduction of our ability to obtain much uh, de more detailed information about uh, structure as well as function and physiology in the brain. So this is uh, our work that uh, introduced uh, functional imaging or fMRI. Uh, and uh, this was uh, um, published in 1992. And what you are looking at is actually a brain uh, here and, um, and the sub of, the, of a subject sitting in the magnet and the uh, subject is in the dark, uh, and you have lights coming on and then uh, coming, going off and coming on and going off. And if you like, look at some areas of the brain, like these two regions, you can see the signal intensity changing. These are MR signal intensities. We are just taking one image after another. Each point there is a single uh, image of this, of this area. And some areas are changing their signal intensity with the lights, and other areas are not. And obviously, if you now take these uh, regions and subtract it from these regions, you get an image like this, this color image over there. This is a functional image of visual stimulation. These are the regions of the brain that are activated, uh, in this case, using visual stimulation. And uh, it, it really relies on a lot of, uh, uh, lot of concept, a lot of discoveries, which I want to briefly summarize for you. First of all is uh, neurovascular coupling. It relies on neurovascular coupling, a concept that was uh, described uh, in 1893 by Roy and Sherrington at uh, Cambridge, Cambridge University. And what they showed was that blood flow in the brain is coupled to neuronal activity. So that is one thing that uh, we are looking at. And so if you have increased neuronal activity, you have increased uh, regional blood flow, and uh, from that, you can then, in principle, op can obtain an image of where the blood flow has increased and can infer where the neural activity has changed. And this is really the, uh, uh, the technology or the concept behind PET imaging, positron emission tomography, to map activation in, in the human brain. So in PET, they generated images like this. For example, this is uh, blood flow changes in the visual, uh, in the visual co cortex in response to a stimulation like this, and, uh, and uh, PET was done for quite a while, the technique that allowed you to uh, image uh, activity in the human brain. But in PET, they actually looked at a couple of other things besides blood flow. Not only blood flow increases, but glucose utilization increases in the same area of the brain that is activated. But furthermore, there's an interesting observation uh, by the PET people and namely that oxygen utilization does not increase as much as blood flow or glucose. In fact, they actually <coughs> said oxygen utilization doesn't increase at all. It turns out that is really uh, wrong, uh, quantitatively wrong, but qualitatively it is correct that it does not increase as much as blood flow or glucose utilization. But that leads to an interesting uh, situation. So you have increased neuronal activity, you have increased regional blood flow now, and then you have a, a situation where you don't have a commensurate increase in regional oxygen consumption rate. Well, there's an imbalance there. That led, leads to a lower deoxyhemoglobin content per unit volume in the brain. So deoxyhemoglobin content for MR people is a very, very interesting molecule. It is very magnetic. So if you now take a big magnet, like this one here, which is what I started with uh, working uh, uh, when we are looking, uh, trying to develop this technique. And of course, we have in our body a lot of little magnets, the water molecules, the hydrogen atoms, actually even the oxygen, but most of the time we are looking at the hydrogen atoms. Uh, they are uh, magnetic. And then we have uh, hemoglobin, which is interestingly diamagnetic, in other words, not very magnetic uh, when it is oxygenated. But it is very magnetic uh, when it is uh, deoxygenated. 
And then, in addition, there's a very interesting phenomena, namely this uh, magnetic molecule is actually sequestered in blood vessels. So it's not uniformly distributed, it's compartmentalized. That has interesting consequences. So if you look at an image, any image has some uh, smallest unit uh, volume, which depict, uh, makes the image, essentially. So for example, uh, this is a single voxel uh, from, uh, we call it a voxel uh, in the image. A single voxel in the image, so there are you know, thousands of them uh, to make the image, it will have some tissue and some blood vessels, but in, if these blood vessels contain deoxyhemoglobin, which is magnetic, and it is sequestered in the, uh, in the blood vessel, then the magnetic field around the blood vessel is non-uniform. And so we are really detecting that non-uniformity in the magnetic field and, how it, and uh, the changes in that non-uniformity to create a, um, a functional image. So you have a situation when you have oxyhemoglobin uh, goes to deoxyhemoglobin, and that is sensitive to uh, brain activity. Inhomogeneity is sensitive to this, and you get an image. So you end up uh, with an image like this. It is, of course, uh, for me, it's a very fascinating um, uh, concept that you go from neuronal activity through all these very complicated uh, events that are happening to create a uh, image of uh, brain function. So very shortly after that uh, introduction, you know, very, uh, where we were looking at very small slices, we were able to get to images like this. Now you are looking at uh, more or less the entire network, you know, lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the first area that uh, input from the eyes come in and then uh, to the visual area, to much more complicated studies uh, like this. You know, in the visual uh, sciences, we know that visual uh, perception is, depends on the location of the visual field. So if a visual uh, uh, subject is looking at one co corner of the visual field versus another one, you have different activation. You can see those so-called retinotopy. And of course, if you are looking at objects like cherries and apples, you identify them in your brain. Not only you see them, but you know that's an apple, and you know it's a cherry, and that activates other regions uh, in the brain going like this. Today, you can even uh, have, uh, you know, you have labs uh, looking at the activation in the human brain with movies. And they can actually correlate the, what the subject is looking at, what is the visual content uh, of this movie versus the activation in the area to drive uh, our understanding of uh, what, what kind of information is processed where and how uh, in the human brain. So an example uh, from uh, our work uh, with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Maastricht University and colleagues uh, actually is in, uh, similar to that, is in, uh, is in auditory cortex. So you can uh, have models of how the brain is working from the, uh, these su such functional images, and you can, actually you can actually try to use these models to um, uh, you know, generate wh or what you think is the brain is, is doing. So, for example, uh, in this case, it's uh, auditory processing. You have a model of the auditory processing. You have then uh, images of uh, activity in the auditory cortex, and you compare it with your model to build your model, uh, to improve your model to see how the brain is actually processing that information. So, of course, in the auditory cortex, you, know, you are looking at you know, uh, spectral and temporal uh, events that are uh, coming in and uh, you can actually do a prediction based on your model. This is an example, I hope you can hear this, but <coughs> so I'm going to play you a, a, you know, a sound that actually the subject is listening to. So, didn't quite, so let's try this one. Oh. Okay, that's the sound, it's a bird sound that the subject is listening to. I'm having a hard time with this one here. Okay, that's the sound the subject is listening to. And that's our construction of what we think the subject is listening to by looking at the brain activity. It is not perfect yet, not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. And we can do the same thing today with uh, visual uh, processes. For example, 
we published a paper where we showed uh, subjects paintings, um, you know, something like 100 paintings, and, uh, and looked at their brain, and, uh, you know, based on the paintings uh, uh, information contact, we actually were able to drive a model of how the brain is processing those things, and later on, we can actually ask the subject to imagine one of those paintings, and we can actually, with 100% accuracy, tell what picture the subject uh, is imagining. Now, MR works, and magnetic resonance imaging works because we actually have in the brain a spatial organization. There's a functional map. Essentially, if we have to act record the activity of every single neuron in the brain to find out what the brain is doing, then uh, magnetic resonance uh, would not be uh, uh, possible. And, but there is a, uh, essentially a situation where uh, neurons that actually perform similar function, there are many of them uh, in advanced you know, uh, brains like the human brain, they are grouped together, and ensembles of neurons performing similar functions are spatially clustered together, so even when you are actually obtaining a functional image in the millimeter scale, we actually, mo I'll tell you more about it, we uh, try to advance that scale, you, you can, act, you can uh, obtain in images coming from the activity of ensembles of neurons. That's what fMRI is doing. And that concept of, you know, uh, things are clustered, uh, I'm sure you, uh, you all know that was first advanced by um, Pierre uh, Olbroca, and who looked at a patient who had, uh, you know, this uh, Broca's aphasia, could not speak. And this is a uh, picture I got from somewhere showing uh, what is the, um, uh, based on all these Broca's patient, uh, uh, Broca's aphasia patients, where the lesion is that leads to Broca's aphasia. It's right over here. And of course, very uh, shortly after fMRI was introduced, we were able to show that, well, you can map that very, very easily without having to uh, resort to patient work. And this is actually just a subject in the magnet sitting and thinking of uh, generating words in a queue by when they were shown a phoneme, you know, so it's a sound of the of particular word. And you can get not only Broca's area and other language areas as well. Now, um, this uh, is now, this kind of technology is used uh, quite a bit, but there's another aspect uh, uh, that uh, comes in with functional imaging. And that particular aspect is used a lot in what, uh, is, uh, uh, what, what I mentioned is the, uh, the Human Connectome Project. Human Connectome Project uh, now is a, I will tell you a little bit more about it, but a uh, big effort, but it started uh, uh, with a grant that was made to Wash U, Oxford, and University of Minnesota, uh, many others, but these were the three uh, major partners that carried the Human Connectome uh, Project. And we were asked by NIH to generate functional and structural connections among gray matter locations in, in, in the entire human, in human brain in the millimeter scale, in the best scale we can achieve. So we uh, launched a lot of technology development, which is uh, what we were working on anyway. And, um, and then we uh, used fMRI, but not task fMRI, which I, what I was showing you. In other words, I was showing you uh, responses of the human brain to visual stimulation or asking uh, to perform a task. But there are spontaneous fluctu fluctuations you can obtain from fMRI that are, uh, give you information about connectivity. And there's another technique, diffusion-weighted uh, MRI. There are lots of them over there, yeah, examples. I'm sure you've seen them. They are beautiful images, uh, aesthetically beautiful. Uh, scientifically, maybe a little bit problematic sometimes, but uh, at least they make very good uh, pictures. And uh, so we were asked to use, the, we, we used these two techniques and then we generated a lot of data, which is publicly accessible, by the way. Um, yeah, not only this MR data, but morphological imaging, task fMRI, phenotyping, and genotyping. I'll show you an example of this in terms of uh, just looking at neuronal activity directly in an animal model. This is by Gordon Smith in CMRR. And uh, he's looking at, uh, in this case, uh, in, in a ferret uh, using uh, uh, GCAMP, but this is a calcium, uh, f a fluorescent protein that reports on calcium uh, transients, and in <coughs> fact, uh, as a result, looks at uh, essentially um, uh, spiking activity. 
So um, he's, uh, essentially, this is a so-called wide field microscopy, and uh, there's an opening in the brain, and he's looking at uh, this. Uh, you can see the blood vessels, and you can see the intensity <coughs> of the images fluctuating. And if you look at these uh, fluctuations, and you plot them, it's, a, it's, a, it's in this you know, many second scale. They are slow, relatively slow fluctuations. Uh, these are ne neuronal activity. I mean, uh, GCAMP report, reports on uh, neuronal activity. And if you now take a particular region, let's say right here, a seed, and then uh, generate a, correlation, a map of correlation. So what are, where are those uh, fluctuations uh, in space correlate with the seed? So all of these are correlated. The blue ones are not correlated. So these areas uh, that are in red have very high correlation. So these areas in red are fluctuation, fluctuating uh, together. And it turns out those are so-called orientation domains in the visual cortex. There are patches of cells in the submillimeter scale. You can see the millimeter scale here that respond to orientations like this. And when you change this orientation, uh, the map changes as well. And in this case, these are orientation domains, but uh, you can e prove them very easily by doing a, a stimulus evoked mapping, and as you can see, there's a match. Now, th that's neuronal activity. In fMRI, we are looking at a surrogate, namely we are looking at uh, the blood <coughs> flow and oxygen consumption changes that are following neuronal activity, but they oscillate as well. So if you just take one image after another and the subject, the human, being is now lying in the magnet, you see that uh, the image intensity fluctuates. In this case, there are three regions, uh, in blue, red, and green, and you see that they, these are actually all correlated in their fluctuation. And if you map, make a map of this correlation, it, it looks like this. This looks like a functional image, but it is not a functional image. It is spatial pattern of correlated activity in the brain. It's spontaneous correlations. So, it's now, for some reason, it's called resting state fMRI because the subject is resting and is not doing in principle, but of course, you know that the brain is not resting. And if you now uh, uh, take a whole brain image and you just take one image after another, you have a so-called fMRI time series. For example, you may have a voxel here like this, oscillating like this, another voxel here like that, oscillating like that. And you have, now, you can actually generate a matrix where you correlate each voxel with every other voxel. So this is a real, this is real data. It's a, a matrix, I keep saying I'm gonna use this, but uh, yeah, here. It's a real data, it's a, a matrix showing one, every voxel correlated with every other voxel. So some voxels are highly correlated, some voxels are not correlated. You, get, you have two lines here, so let's say that there's a, if you put a seed here, you can get its correlation. Uh, Another seed here, maybe you can get its correlation with other voxels. They, they look like this. I mean, that's the matrix data is an image as, as well. So here's a seed uh, and its correlation and anti-correlation for the rest of the brain. And you move the seed and you get uh, that. This, uh, these images are essentially those two lines in that matrix. So then you can query this matrix in many, uh, many different ways. One way uh, that is very popular uh, also, especially with our Oxford colleagues, is to use um, so-called independent component analysis. This is a data-driven approach. It doesn't, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to uh, assume anything, essentially. You look at the data, and you can, you know, cluster the data or, you know, uh, d divide it into extract components uh, from it, and then you can then cluster it, which they have done over here, and uh, you can actually then look at these um, uh, different clusters, you know, for example, these are from the human connectome project. Uh, uh, so regions which are uh, uh, correlated with each other. So there are regions like this, etc. Now, uh, so this is a totally, you know, data-driven approach. No assumption about what is going on in the data. So you can take one of those components, for example, ICA component 18 in this particular analysis doesn't mean anything uh, other than it's just one of those multiple components you pulled out from the data. It looks like this uh, in, uh, in the brain. Uh, so well, you know, that looks like a, maybe a motor cortex activity here in the cerebellum. 
And we have in the Human Connectome Project not only these spontaneous activity, but we have actually task-based fMRI. So you can go and uh, probe the task-based fMRI. And here's a task-based fMRI of left-hand movement. Subjects are moving their left hand. You can see that they're identical here. So this is not a task-based, just look, looking at spontaneous. <coughs> this is you ask them to move their hands. So essentially what this is telling, and by the way, the, since this is uh, hand movement is uh, lateralized in the brain, you can find another component. Well, now this is uh, on the other hemisphere, and now you look at uh, right hand movement, again, beautiful correlation. So essentially what's happening is that in the brain, areas that are somehow linked together and work together to accomplish particular tasks also oscillate together. We don't know exactly why uh, they are oscillating together, but they do. And those oscillations, of course, uh, um, um, change in time, and you can uh, monitor this. And this is uh, from a paper we published on the Human Connectome Project showing the different regions participating in these uh, different areas and networks. Now, as I said, you know, we, um, like, uh, we like tool development and then application of these tools. Uh, to achieve all of these, we actually did do quite a bit of technical development. I just want to, I, I won't go into the details, but I want to give you a flavor <coughs> of it. For example, uh, one of the things we had to do is uh, acquire those images very, very fast in the MR time scale. <coughs> so if you look at uh, typically how you acquire images in the MR world, you know, one uh, approach is to get uh, multiple slices, one slice at a time. So how long it takes you to acquire the image is then determined by how many slices you have, which means how, what is the spatial resolution, and how long it takes you to acquire a single <coughs> slice. But uh, we came up uh, with a technique whereby we now acquire multiple slices at the same time, like eight slices. We just uh, you know, excite eight slices. And then uh, we use information inherent in uh, detectors. Those detectors, you know, like an array of detectors, they have different sensitivities to different regions. We use that information to unalias those eight slices to correct uh, to get a single slice image. So this uh, then uh, allowed us, for example, to go uh, significantly faster. So this is a standard uh, at the time uh, how you would get a uh, resting state data and get some of these networks. Just an example primary visual cortex, sensory motor cortex networks uh, detected by resting state. And this is <coughs> by the technique that we brought in into the Human Connectome Project. So instead of uh, acquiring the whole brain in 5.7 seconds, now we are at 0.7 seconds. Statistical significance uh, improves, and also you start seeing you know, areas which we know should be there, but were not being detected, but are detected now with this fast evolution. So there is another thing that in the Human Connectome Project, which is a major technical advance, comes from our earlier work, and that is to use uh, very high magnetic fields as well. So most of the Human <coughs> Connectome Project data is at three Tesla, but we have a small amount of data uh, at, uh, uh, at seven Tesla. And this is a uh, seven Tesla. We developed this essentially before the Human Connectome Project because we knew that uh, functional mapping signals are we expected them to be better at uh, 7 Tesla, both in terms of sensitivity and uh, uh, accuracy in, in, uh, with respect to neural activity. So in 7 Tesla, this is just to show you that magnetic fields are important in functional uh, imaging. This is so-called contrast to noise, how well you can detect uh, functional imaging signals as a function of magnetic field. I won't go into the detail of what those three uh, lines are, but the important point is they just go up significantly when you go to high magnetic field. So, for example, this is our human connectome project data at three Tesla, and we put a seed in this uh, um, particular area, subcortical region, and we are asking what are the connections from this particular seed to the, to the, you know, to the cortex. And at three Tesla, this data is noise, essentially around uh, zero correlation. It's noisy, we cannot tell that. But uh, at seven Tesla, as you can see, we can actually extract that information very easily. There have been a lot of uh, nice results coming out. I really have, uh, I cannot uh, go through them, but just some examples. Uh, we published a paper uh, in Nature where Nature decided this is the brain, the brain is redefined, essentially parcellation 
of uh, brain areas based on the human connectome data. This is another paper uh, uh, coming again from the human connectome, our human connectome project, where we looked at there's quite a lot of uh, uh, brain data as well as behavioral data uh, uh, that was collected in this. And uh, there are a lot of correlations between the brain networks that we can extract and uh, a lot of other uh, behavioral properties. Just an example, this is uh, um, fluid intelligence score versus what you can extract from uh, 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 the brain data. And of course, we can, uh, there's an ex extremely good correlation between the networks that you get from functional imaging data and uh, fluid intelligence. <coughs> Some other examples, um, uh, Finn et al. from Yale showed that you can identify individuals uh, based on their brain connectivity from fMRI data. Um, you can actually predict if you have these uh, uh, fluctuations data, you know, spontaneous activity, you can predict how each individual will respond to a task. Um, <clears throat> maybe that is not so surprising, but the fact that you can do that is actually uh, very interesting. And of course, uh, there will be a lot more coming up about genetics and uh, brain activity because we just released uh, relatively recently uh, sequencing for each of the subjects we have used, but <coughs> already there are some examples that uh, can canonical genetic signatures of the adult human brain correlate with these networks. I'll give you an example from our work uh, on the, uh, this particular fingerprinting. This is data uh, from seven Tesla. But essentially, I showed you these ma matrices. So each individual brain is represented by a matrix. And you can take a particular individual. You can say, all right, here's a subject one. And, and I have a pool of individuals. Can I identify who this uh, individual is based on uh, the similarity of this matrix to these matrices represented by my N subject? And we can do that really very, very well. This is seven Tesla data. And uh, this is the identification rate from coming from different regions. But some of these regions, you can see that uh, you have better than 95 per, you know, 97, 98 um, uh, percent uh, success rate in identifying the individual. And these are the regions uh, where the identification is uh, really very high. You know, so the frontal areas and the parietal areas, for example, <coughs> seem to do very well. And uh, you can do this when subjects are just uh, sitting and doing nothing, or they're watching a movie, and the identification rate goes up when they are performing uh, something like watching a movie. And you are now close to 100% uh, ability to identify from this brain data who that individual is. So these are unique uh, to our brains. And these are some of the interesting differences uh, that you find in terms of identification success when they are just sitting there and they're, when they're watching the movie. You know, for example, temporal lobe areas come in potentially because they are you know, interacting with the movie, recognizing a lot of scenes, etc. Um, I have a few more slides that I want to talk to you about. I hope I can continue or... All right. Um, so then the diffusion imaging. Diffusion imaging, uh, just to give you some, you know, you, you know, of course you've seen a lot of these uh, images, but uh, you may, you know, give you a background on that. You know, water diffuses freely in a in a in a glass of uh, in a glass or a beaker. It diffuses freely and isotropically. It can it has equal probability of diffusing anywhere in the in the in the glass. But you put it in a brain, it's very different. Now the diffusion is restricted. So if you have, for example, external fibers running like this and the water molecules uh, uh, are now in between, they will bounce back from these uh, boundaries and uh, they will have a very uh, easy diffusion in this direction but will, be, uh, will have restricted diffusion in that direction. So diffusion we can follow in MR and uh, you can get these uh, anisotropic diffusion measures and from that you generate these uh, very attractive pictures, or the pictures that you've seen <coughs> in the announcement. Now, at, in the Human Connectome Project, we again improved on those diffusion techniques significantly, really a very big change. So this is Human Connectome uh, data 
looking at the connections between language areas in the human brain and also uh, defining the language areas uh, by this ICA analysis. And they are uh, in uh, excellent agreement. Beyond the human connectome data, um, uh, at 7 Tesla again, you can get much higher resolutions. You can see uh, these uh, diffusion fibers, I mean these fibers now depicted so that there's white matter and going bending and going into the uh, cortical gray matter. This is a much higher uh, resolution image and more accurate. In any rate, I want to convey to you that the uh, Human Connectome Project uh, has generated uh, a publicly available 1,200 subject data set uh, at 3 Tesla and then 180 subject data set at 7 Tesla. There's some limited MEG data as well. Very, very uh, highly uh, curated uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, different level of processing. You can get raw data, you can get partially processed data, and uh, there are more than 500 uh, papers now uh, actually coming uh, from this data. NIH considered this a success, and now we, they've launched a lot of new projects. Uh, there's, for example, human connectome looking at lifespan. We are looking at babies, children ages 5 to 21, adults aging, etc. A lot of disease connectome projects. And uh, there is a uh, developing HCP uh, in, in the UK. This is uh, uh, really an ambitious project uh, looking at prenatal images. And there's a very similar uh, HCP-like project running by NIH, uh, so-called ABCD, now uh, where they are, unlike the human connectome project, this project ABCD <coughs> will run for many years so that they will follow individuals as they age. Now, however, you know, uh, when, when the Human Connectome Project was in the middle, uh, then came the Brain Initiative. And there was a paper by Tom Inzel, Story Landis, Francis Collins. Francis Collins is the head of NIH, so head of NIMH, head of NINDS, head of, overall head of NIH. And they said, well, you know, it's all great what these MR people are doing. Human neuroimaging captures uh, the whole brain in action but each one millimeter cube voxel includes at least 80,000 neurons and four and a half million synapses, all right? And then uh, they put together a, a human uh, uh, the brain initiative. That's the Obama brain initiative. <coughs> and that's a document that came out from the strategic planning of the brain initiative. And this, you know, uh, a, a very ambitious document. And what they call is maps at multiple scales from synapses to whole brain. I mean, that's an enormous challenge to be able to go from synapses to whole brain. But is it a dream? It's really not a dream. Certainly not in an animal model. But uh, so we have MR techniques. I showed them to you uh, quite a bit. So this is the human connectome project data. It's whole brain. And I'll show you a little bit. We can actually push this resolution using very high magnetic fields to a mesoscopic scale. These are so-called cortex. You know, this is the cortex thickness. This is about two, three millimeters. These are orientation domains. I showed you uh, optical imaging data from that. And uh, we can measure, we can actually image at the scale. And we've been trying uh, to extend that imaging range with MR. That's one of our major goals. And then from there on, MR techniques fail, but uh, you have optical techniques. This is a two photon image, but now there are three photon techniques that are coming in, which actually um, uh, can uh, cover uh, more depth than, uh, uh, you know, two photon. And, of course, both techniques have limitations. Right? One technique cannot go to the single uh, photon, uh, single <coughs> neuron level. These are single neurons. And then the other technique cannot go to this, but they have an overlap. They do have an overlap uh, right over here. And this is uh, an area that we are very much interested in. Uh, we're building a lot of effort on this. We, are, we already have quite a bit of effort on this, trying to push this to these levels, and we are trying to push this over there to get this overlap working. So, seven Tesla, I mentioned to you, we really developed the seven Tesla not for the human connectome project. It was very useful for it, but because we wanted to image these things, and we were asking the question, can we get to that spatial resolution? And magnetic field strength turned out to be very important. And uh, we actually published uh, imaging, the so-called ocular dominance columns and the orientation columns, you know, 2007, 2008. So we were able to demonstrate that you can get to that scale. 
today this is a very, uh, you know, it's a booming activity, uh, human neuroscience at this mesoscopic scale, and there are some examples of that uh, over here. So they're all about uh, spatial resolution of 0.5 microliter voxels, but we still have in the, you know, in the brain initiative, Obama brain initiative, we have ambitions to go to 0.1 microliter. And so as a result, we actually in, uh, launched the 10 and a half Tesla project. So this is our 10 and a half Tesla magnet. It's a 110 ton magnet uh, being placed uh, in a 600 ton iron shield to contain the magnetic field outside. Uh, it looks daunting, as you can see, um, almost uh, scary. And um, its installation is a story on its own. But you know, you uh, work with your colleagues and make some beautiful makeup for the magnet, and uh, it doesn't look so uh, uh, threatening. And it's a project that we started in 2009, and the first images we got in 2017. Now, not only technical issues of getting this working, but then there are also sort of regulatory issues. So we have to work uh, with FDA now because it's a very new magnetic field. We have to work with IRB. But anyway, in 2017, uh, December, we got the first images. And they are my colleagues, uh, Greg Metzger, Pierre-Francois Van de Mortet, who is Belgian, actually, and uh, uh, Andrea Grant, um, uh, very happy. Um, and uh, of course, I am too, and a uh, uh, very major uh, accomplishment. So these are some first images. Project is for the brain, but we haven't. Uh, we started with the torso, which is a more difficult target to image at higher magnetic fields. But this has had something to do with safety reasons because we really have to go step by step. Uh, we're working with FDA demonstrate safety. Um, but uh, here are some ten and a half test uh, body images. This is prostate, uh, uh, kidneys, uh, heart, and uh, uh, spine, and. You may uh, say, well, OK, I've seen images similar to this uh, from uh, other magnetic fields. But let me uh, tell you that imaging the abdomen or the torso is a major challenge at high fields. The fact that uh, we can do this is uh, you know, really, a, I must say, a, a, an accomplishment. And when I um, uh, sent one of these first images to a colleague at Siemens and uh, I, I showed Oh, here's a first image from uh, 10 and a half Tesla. I said, oh, why start with something easy like the brain? You know, just go straight to the torso. So we know that the brain will be easy because we can get images like this. But we have to actually do a lot more work on safety. But here, even though in, uh, superficially it looks like an image you would have gotten from one and a half Tesla, it actually is not. So if you look at the detail, the resolution is much higher. For example, when you're looking at the spinal cord, you can see this uh, gray-white matter differentiation in the standard half Tesla image, uh, uh, very beautiful. And, uh, but these are also the thing that I want to also convey to you, the first set of images. We did not spend really much time in optimization. We have mainly concerned with safety issues right now and reporting to FDA uh, what is happening. But we did get finally one RF coil approved uh, by the FDA and a first brain image. Again not necessarily the end uh, or the best, but the very first just to demonstrate that we can do it. And uh, it already looks very nice, but uh, many, many more technical developments have to be achieved. Uh, and then maybe if Jan invites me in about three years, I can show you not only cortical columns, but whole brain images at the level of subcortical columns, shall we say, at 10 and a half Tesla. With that, I'd like to st uh, stop. And, uh, of course, acknowledge some of the people who have done the work, but I, you, some of the names you have seen. And, but uh, CMR is a very large group of people, you know, composed of uh, a lot of uh, engineering and physicists, as well as neuroscientists and uh, uh, medical doctor, but doctors. But uh, most importantly, our engineering group, uh, really, uh, he, they can build a lot of these instruments and make this uh, happen. Uh, it's led by Gregor Adriani uh, over here and uh, uh, many others. And uh, image reconstruction is a very big, uh, again, a lot of technological developments uh, coming from Steen and Mehmet Akçakaya 
I mentioned to you the Human Connectome Project, and this is our consortium, one of their all hands meeting. Major universities, WashU, University of Minnesota, uh, Oxford. Oxford generated all the tools like FSL for image processing. All the image acquisition techniques uh, came from us, and WashU uh, uh, does a lot of the uh, compiling of the data. And if you want the data today to download it, you have to go to WashU site and other universities involved in MGH and very, uh, M M uh, uh, MEG and other technologies. So in particular, I'd like to acknowledge my co-principal investigator, David Van Essen, here, and we are standing together in this group. Um, these are individuals who really made the technology for the Human Connectome Project, and uh, including, as I mentioned, Pierre Francois from Belgium, and. Uh, um, our you know, colleagues from uh, Oxford, the FIMRIB, uh, Tim Behrens, Stam, Saad, and Jesper in, for diffusion imaging, uh, Steve Smith and Carla Miller for uh, functional imaging, and again, Matt Glasser, David Van Essen. And among the data I showed you, um, especially the auditory cortex, they are in collaboration with Maastricht University College. We have a long-standing uh, collaboration with them on the auditory cortex. With that, I'd like to stop and thank you very much for your attention.